So uh, this is the title of the talk. Have you seen this? Sweet streams are made of this energy efficiency in video streaming. So this is mainly um, an overview of uh, video streaming with a little bit of an example of what we have did in terms of, um, of making this better. Uh, also, this sweet streams are made of this. This is actually a title from a uh, from an article that we released two or three months ago. And that was also one thing where we had a lot of discussions during lunch and it was a lot of fun to find a nice pun with uh, streams and something that people relate to. And I hope you know that famous one. I like it a lot. And it's always in my mind when I read it and it gives you a good feeling, I hope. So let me start. Uh, maybe a quick introduction to my background, where I come from and what I'm doing. So I'm at Friedrich Alexander University Erlam in Nuremberg. It's this very, very beautiful building, also from the 70s, similar to the buildings you have here. Um, the head of the chair is Mr. Andre Kau, professor, maybe you've heard of him. He's quite famous in the field. And uh, at that chair, we have three research groups. I'm in this first one on video signal processing and transmission, and I'm a senior scientist together with a colleague. And uh, in, uh, let's say, in the last three to four years, I was able to build up a little group of researchers who is working on energy efficiency in video communications. We call them the energy efficiency video experts, or short E, the EDE. And uh, yeah, we have a tiny web page showing what we're doing. At the moment, I have three PhD students um, and myself, of course. We have fundings from industry and from, um, from the state, basically. The DFG is the German foundation that gives most of the money for pure research. Um, we've been active in standardizations. Um, and yes, we're at, at the moment, in fact, we're still growing. I'm very happy that we will have soon a fourth guy who's joining our team. And um, I'm, well, of course, it's quite nice to see that people are interested in this topic and also in the whole worldwide community. I see that research and um, interest is growing. So this as a background. Now let me go on with a little bit of the topic what I wanted to talk about. First of all, this introduction is something that might seem familiar. We're talking about video streaming. And today, this is all ubiquitous. We have a lot of different um, services, applications, and things that we can do. We can do it with a lot of different devices. We're having laptops. You have all your laptops open right now, but you can use your smartphone, home TVs, and so on. And you have different kinds of applications, which was, well, 10 years ago, would have not been foreseen that we will have so many actors which only concentrate on videos in different kinds of um, scenarios. Uh, and yes, even now I'm streamed on Zoom as I just learned. And of course we do that nowadays. So this is of course good because we can say greenhouse gas emissions, not this time because I went to, um, well, to Ren, to have here. But in many cases you can stay at home and the people who stayed at home right now, they save greenhouse gas emissions. So thanks for you guys. That's good for our planet. <laughs> um, and at least here, I'm always like to point out that airplane, I took the train to get here which is better, which is still not perfect, which is not bad, much better. <laughs> so, uh, well, we could say that well, from this, what we find is video streaming is great. We have a new kind of technology that helps us to solve problems that were before only possible to solve by transportation. And it's uh, well known and clear and near to every one of us that streaming is much better than transportation in terms of carbon intensity. Now, why is it a problem? Why are we doing research on this? Um, and for this, I will first give um, a quick idea why. So this is a brief outline, the first part of my presentation, energy consumption in online video. Oh, by the way, does this work? No, it does not, but I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then you need to find out how to erase. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, okay. that's, that's life learning, right? <laughs> that's right. Uh, okay, okay, that was wrong. Maybe this one? No, no the first one you click is, is the right one. Just to, just to confirm. Ah, I need to confirm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, but I cannot switch the slides. No, this no, board, right? Not like this. No, okay. You need the next one. Okay. An extra cable? Good. Okay. Thanks. Maybe next time. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so let me go on. Yes, so I will talk first about energy consumption in online video. Um, and then I will try to go a little bit into the detail on what happens in um, energy for in on the system level when we are streaming videos. So what we've been focusing on in the last years was mainly the encoding and the decoding process, where I know that you guys are also 
very much into, and you have a lot of knowledge about that. But we found that that is only a part of what is done, in fact, when we are doing a whole video streaming pipeline. So we're having a look at that, which is taken basically from that um, publication that I talked about in the beginning. But then also I would like to give some ideas on what we did in terms of this optimization of decoding energy, which is, of course, only the decoder part. But as you are working with OpenBBC, I think you're also mainly responsible for OpenHDBC, where we did a lot of measurements with. So I think this is also very interesting for you and a good starting point for discussions, of course. So um, I planned for roughly 25, 30 minutes. I'm not sure if this is what you like. And uh, if I take that clock up there, then I have no doubt that I can <laughs> take <laughs> All right, so let me start with the first thing. So this is some figures that you might have heard before, um, just repeating them as uh, the general introduction that we have nowadays. Uh, we have this shift project that you might have heard of. It's the think tank from France. And we had yesterday in the morning a keynote speech of a guy from the shift project, which was quite interesting to, to get to know one of those. And in one of their studies from 2019, they found out about the carbon emissions caused by ICT. And if we have the worldwide greenhouse gas emissions, so this is 800%, then uh, they said that ICT was um, responsible for 4% back then. And if we look one step further to video communications or online video, anything that you do with video, then it was 1% uh, of, uh, of this full range. So 1% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And that was 2019. In between, we had COVID and a big rise, and we have different other um, well developments. Um, so that we well, we can say that uh, it is still this at least a similar number. I'm not sure if it's two percent or three percent, but it's something that is realistic. Uh, what people might also think is that hey, one percent is nothing, but uh, compared to aviation, global aviation, which is four percent, it again seems quite a lot, which I think is an interesting comparison. And well, we got rid of global aviation for almost two years, which was uh, quite a relief, but uh, well, it's back on. So uh, this is some more information from that study. Um, they tried to find out where these uh, carbon emissions come from and stem from. They found out two main causes. We have the production of devices, which is mainly end user devices, meaning TVs, desktop PCs, smartphones is a large part and others. Smartphones is mainly a reason because it's a very, very high quantity, much larger than TVs, for example. And um, then we have the use site, which we think of usually while we are really watching a video. So what we use in terms of energy and battery uh, while we're using this. And here we have the three main components, data centers, networks, and end user devices. Data centers is, uh, the, for example, Amazon Web Services or the big server farms, which would process the videos, encode videos, store them, and deliver them to the end user. Networks is, of course, the transmission through 4G, 5G, copper, fiber, wireless, wired, whatever you can think of. And we have the end user devices, which are basically these components we have here. Um, production of data centers is, of course, energy intensive for a single data center. But as the number of data centers is quite low with respect to TVs, um, it can be summed up among others because it's not that much in total. <clears throat> Any questions so far? All right, good. Uh, yeah, then a little, I said that there is a lot of interest. This is just some um, things that I noticed in the last years where people all over the world are interested in this topic. Uh, for example, in Green MPEG, we're having a, a, currently a track where new things are standardized. In industry, um, I found some Actors like BBC from Great Britain or RTL is a very famous German television group who are actually interested in this topic and are, who are doing studies and spending money on that. And uh, last year, I heard of a project called Greening of Streaming, which, well, which is uh, something like a body for industry actors who are interested in making streaming more green. Well, green of Streaming, I think it stands for itself. And they are also quite active at the moment. So... There's a growing interest in this topic. And then uh, finally, some examples of what we have in terms of CO2 emissions. It's always also nice to see. 
Um, so if I would have taken a plane, this is only for my own conscience, but <laughs> that's okay. If I would have taken a plane from Erlangen to Rennes, would have had 173 kilograms of CO2. Taking the train is much better. Uh, so these numbers are, of course, or rather estimates. This morning I heard that this is probably a little bit too low, but I'm not sure. Um, an, an episode of Top Chef or the streaming would be in this range, so one thousandth of uh, the amount. So it would even be better. Uh, so we always have to think, does it make sense to do this, to travel this long? But uh, as we're having a conference and having a talk here, I'm trying to have more talks. So really trying to condense and have a lot of benefit from what we're doing. And then I hope that this makes sense to spend so much uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide. And just as a uh, yeah, as, as another comparison, if you take the car, which is uh, equally bad as a plane, especially if you drive alone, or what a usual German house needs in terms of heating. So I'm not sure how much heating is needed here in then, but in Germany, that's a typical figure. Okay, so this is the introduction. Now I would like to go a little bit more into some uh, content. So system level energy consumption is something that we started looking at, let's say three to four years ago. And the idea was to get an overview on what happens in all the different components in a video on an online video system. Uh, and do we have knowledge on what they consume in terms of energy or estimates or models or whatever we can find about that. So. This is rather a literature research than doing real hands-on measurements or something, but which we found to be very interesting and uh, insightful. So this is basically the setup that we came up with, of course, at a very, very high level. But uh, these are basically all the components that you need to set up an online video system. We have the provider side, as we had before, like the data centers can be a single server, it can be many servers, and it can be server farms all over the world. We have the transmission network, which is also quite complex. We have mobile network base stations. They are connected to internet exchange points. We've got big internet exchange points in for, uh, all of Europe. We've got smaller ones. Sometimes we've got submarine cables from Atlantic to Europe and so on and so on. Then we've got uh, routers at your home, we've got switches and many, 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 many devices. But in the end, they all do the same. They just transmit data from one point to the next. And there are very sophisticated models and ways of modeling how much power is needed for this. And then finally, we have the end user terminals, which is, well, the typical thing that you use when you're watching a video, a smartphone, desktop PC. Uh, of course, a camera is also often used nowadays. One is here, which is quite useless. I guess we could switch it off. It would save energy. So <laughs> that's good. We have TVs, of course, laptops, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, this is not fully complete. There can be other things, but it's somehow how we can think of this at a from a high level perspective. And then, uh, unfortunately, this is not yet fully enough, especially if we look at the provider site, then a very important thing is the so-called content delivery network that you might have heard of. That's what uh, the big video providers use, YouTube, Netflix, I guess also Disney Plus and so on. So um, instead of having a video on a single server and everyone who wants to watch that video would request the same server and this single server would have to send this video to all the requests, you would have a content delivery network with a lot of servers all over the world. And these servers will store different kinds of representations of the video with different languages um, at different resolutions and so on. There is an algorithm behind that says we need this kind of representation there and this one can be removed. Then you update this from time to time because Netflix in May gives you Harry Potter. In uh, October, you will have Star Wars or whatever. So uh, this is a running system that needs to be maintained, which is also not that easy to have. And of course, an important thing is video transcoding. So decoding and encoding to a different representation. And then we look at uh, what we found in the literature, what actually happens. We can again split up into the three components. We have data centers, the transmission and the end user. And we try to figure out what actually has an impact on the energy and power that we need. And uh, this is the most important things that we came up with. If we look at the data centers, 
then of course it makes a difference on how many numbers we have and we provide. The more video Netflix will provide, the more videos will have to be transcoded to different representations, bitrate ladders, whatever you have you would like. We have the encodings, we need to store them somewhere, sometimes uh, only one or two copies, sometimes many, many copies all over the world. Um, then you have to decide on how to uh, set up your CDN. How many servers do you operate? Where are they located? Do I really need them or not? Because of course, another server, you can always ask yourself, is that needed or can I just remove it and still it would work? Uh, and of course, the number of requests. So if you have more people requesting a video, you will also need more energy for that. For transmission, it is quite simple in the end. At least that's what I found in the literature. It's only the bit rate. And that only, let's say partially, because uh, the transmission network is always running 24 seven being, well, at some load. It's always something like a base power. And even if there were no transmission at all, you would have uh, quite a high base power that it consumes in an idle mode. And if you put some additional bit rate, uh, the energy for that would rise and would increase, but only not marginally, but only a little. It's not like if you double your bit rate, you have twice the energy consumption of everything, but it's like, uh, oh yeah, I can draw something. Let's try. Someone said here we have the throughput, let's call it T. And here we have the power consumption of any kind of device that you would use a node, if it makes exchange point. And you often have a threshold power or a, an offset power P0. And afterwards, you have something that goes quite linear like this to a maximum throughput. So this would be T max. That's something that often, uh, that often happens. And uh, in fact, so the relation is, of course, not fully true. It depends on the device and the measurement that you do. But uh, in many cases, you have a very big offset and then only a small part that is close to linear. So this is about bitrate. Uh, and of course, you can think, where does my um, bit uh, goes through? It could be transmitted to Frankfurt, then to Bulgaria, to Asia, and then back to you here in France, maybe. You never know which way it takes. And that's why people said, well, we don't know, we can't measure, and it also does not make sense to measure because we do not care at all. So they just take a single uh, mean value usually and say we have something like uh, six microjoules per bit, something like that. And no matter where you are, how you are, um, especially in the real internet, it's not really distinguishable. If you have your home router somewhere, I'm not sure if we have one here, but then, okay, then you can say, I'm operating this myself. I could switch it off. Then you could attribute it. But otherwise, it's just impossible to do that. Then we have the end user devices. And uh, the main thing in end user devices is naturally, which one do you take? If you take your 120-inch uh, TV, it will be different than your smartphone. And um, yeah, depending on that, you have different kinds of energy consumptions. Then, of course, it depends on how long you use your video, the streaming duration, but it also depends to a large extent on video parameters, which is bit rate, resolution, um, uh, frame rate, which are the most high level ones, but in fact, also to quite an extent, video codec and how you, which encoder you use, which decoder you use, hardware decoding, software decoding, but of course, also how your um, device then um, processes the video afterwards. Sometimes you have um, error correction or you have rescaling and stuff like that. So a lot of things change. We also test it uh, and try to find out about audio and it is quite negligible. It's really quite negligible nowadays. Any questions on this? Uh, yes. And in terms of the network that you use on the end user, if it's wireless or wired, mm -hmm. you see a difference? Do you notice a difference? That is a very good question. So we notice a difference if we go to 3G. We had some measurements with 3G. That was, of course, more than going from an uh, internal storage. Uh, now, let me think. Do, do I have some? Yes, we did that. But I think I did not compare directly wireless with wired. I know that Wi-Fi is more energy efficient than 3G, but with 4G, it is um, not a big deal anymore. It's much, much better in terms of energy efficiency. 
But then again, I was only able to measure this, the end user device, the smartphone, and not the base station. Fortunately, I don't have hands on a base station. But I think you can find model for, because you have yeah. kind of uh, networks, you have the core of network, mm -hmm. and then the access, mm -hmm. which can be uh, fiber optics or mm -hmm. uh, 3G, 4G, and, uh, yes. and, and you can have model specific. Uh, so yes. it's better to have fiber, for example. Wait. Yes, it is absolutely, and we find numbers online. You can find them. In fact, I have yeah. have seen some publications which show the average number for fiber, for copper, and the difference, and also for three G and four G. But I don't have them memorized right now. But it's available, and in many cases, you can also measure that. As uh, if you do not go for base stations, of course, then it's more complicated. Um, except you have contacts to industry, and that would be interesting. Um, absolutely. But uh, in fact, at that conference, there are very good people who can help in this direction. So there is one from Ericsson in, in uh, Sweden, and he's got hands really directly on that exact information and really good numbers on that. And also he had a paper where we compared copper to wireless connection, and that is very interesting to see. So if you're interested in that, I can give you some more information later. One question about... Uh... For the transmission, you said that you have only the bit rate, but imagine that you have a video in the USA and you going from a U, maybe New York to Rennes mm -hmm. is not the same in terms of energy that coming from uh, Paris to Rennes. So it's in a real building in model for that. Oh, it's almost the same, in fact. There, there was another, another start, start study that I found interesting. So uh, if I say so um, it was from, I think, 2012, a little bit longer ago. But they said they looked at the power over the distance. Yes. The distance from Switzerland to West Coast, US, I think, and they or Japan, something like that. And they really checked how much power do I need for each of those steps and each of those nodes. And it was really, really nice to see because the curve went like this. And this was um, um, probably, if, uh, well, where do we have uh, connection? This was one coast and this was the other coast. And in between is almost nothing because, uh, well, it's a very, very big line. And there is uh, a lot of gigabits per second, which is transmitted. And if you divide by the little number of gigabits you have here, the, some, some kilobits, then it doesn't matter anymore. It's just a very line, long line. Mm -hmm. But uh, because you just have a very, very high amount of devices here, especially um, at the end user side here at the, at the very end, then, uh, well, everything in between is not that important. And that's one reason why people say, well, if long distances don't really count, so why not take a, a single mean value? Because it doesn't really change if you have a long traveling distance. And uh, another question, but maybe I go too much in the detail, but to do. So you said that you have a, a like a static uh, a power consumption for a transmission, mm -hmm. uh, but I remember the the paper from Netflix saying that we will uh, just taking account of the increase of uh, of the power due to the transmission of your uh, phone video, for example, but. Uh, uh, I think that uh, you have to share the, the, the basic, the static power uh, to all the user because if there is nobody, uh, uh, you can switch off the, the transmission. That's another difficult question. Yes, what do you do with the cases with the one where I had before, right? Yes, if you have always. Should you assign this this offset power that you have? Should you yes. assign that to the bit rate, or should you assign that to the people who make use of the yes. device, right? Yeah, that's a, I think that's an accounting question, and I do not have the answer for that. <laughs> okay, it's, it's really difficult. I don't really know what is, but uh, in fact, that's what people are trying to do. And the guy from Ericsson to, uh, also said that, that if they have devices and servers or lines that are really idle, which might happen in Sweden, there are some regions where not many people are residing or living, mm -hmm. then they try to introduce, well, sleep modes. And that was not available something like 10 years ago, and they included it in their um, devices. And for such cases, it's much better. It's what you can do from the provider side. But still, of course, if you have two or three users, somehow, how do you map that to the people who use it, this power? It's 
yeah, I think it's accounting. You can do it this way or that way. And I could not say that one is more right than the other, at least personally. It's quite hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, is it um, the base power consumption in idle mode, is it somewhat correlated to the maximum throughput of the, yeah. Is, is there any link, like for example, if the maximum throughput was lower, uh, is it is the idle mode power consumption would be lower? Mm -hmm. That is a very good. Yes, I, I understand. That's a very good question, but to be honest, I don't know. I really don't know. I just know that over time, if you replace devices, they will have a higher throughput. And uh, usually they build it in such a way that the idle power will also be reduced because we're always going into energy efficiency. But um, if there is a general rule, like you have the exact same technology and then you have one with a high and a low throughput, I, I don't know. Okay. I would need some people who are yeah, do, doing this things to ask. All right, good, then let me go on. Okay, uh, yes, I will get that out. By the way, is this also recorded? No, it isn't, right? No. Okay, the government will not see that, that's a shame, okay. Mm. Good, so uh, then, so now here we have the idea of what causes energy consumption. That was the first thing we tried to find out. And then we can go the next step and say, we have so many different video services with different prerequisites. Now, um, how do they cope with these different energy consumption issues? And then we had a look at, uh, well, four examples in, in that paper and try to find out and figure out which are the most important things to have. And that's, uh, well, quite common sense to do that, quite straightforward. Assume that you are an on-demand service, for example, Netflix, and you know that you have very few videos, only a couple of hundred, and you will have millions of users to, um, well, to satisfy. So this is what we have, we will have few videos. We will probably have quite a complex CDN. We will probably have many, many requests per video, at least most videos. Um, we will have high bit rates because people will have their big XL screen with a great ultra HD video experience. Uh, and we will have very high end customer devices. And usually if people watch this, they will stay in front of their TV for quite a long time, meaning two hours. And we know nowadays a uh, span and attention span of people is rather 15 seconds. So it's amazing that it still works. <laughs> So this on-demand services, another very famous example is uh, social networks. That is quite somehow the opposite, although it's still um, about videos. We don't have a few videos, we have millions of videos. I don't know how many, I tried to find out, but uh, those figures to come, we need again connections to the industry. But uh, well, who of you is using it and people just, well, they upload videos every day, sometimes dozens of videos. Um, TikTok is another example for this. What you would probably do is you would do cheap transcoding because if you would do a very high, uh, high level X265, very slow preset for each of those videos, then you might have big problems with um, complexities. And what you often have is you have very few requests per video, maybe one, maybe two. And there's even a bunch of videos that is never watched at all. We will probably have low bit rates. And um, it's a fact that people in quality of experience, they found out that uh, the quality is actually not important at all in such videos. People don't care. You will have low-end customer devices. Well, I mean uh, low-end, not uh, bad smartphones, but smartphones. So not, not a big TV, but tiny things that you can quickly use. And uh, the famous 15 seconds short durations to keep attention, of course. Another example is uh, live streaming. Something that we're having actually right now um, maybe not that many requests in this case, I would assume, but if you assume the last football match of uh, the World League or whatever, then there is quite many requests, so many people watching at the same time. We only have a single video. We need real-time transcoding, otherwise people will not like you. If the video will not be there in time. Um, still, you need a very good quality at the same time, so we will have high bit rates, probably higher than for um, the for well, this first case of streaming, because uh, you cannot afford to do a lot of encoding and a lot of complex encoding to reduce bit rates, because it's just not enough time for that. 
So we have high bid rates. And of course, we still have high end customer de devices. So basically the people who watch live streaming are in a similar condition as the ones um, in on-demand video streaming. And uh, one last example, teleconferencing, uh, Zoom could be duplex, could be more participants, usually let's say few participants. So um, by few, I mean, we can have, of course, 50 participants in, in such a, a conferencing scenario, but this is still well, some uh, magnitudes below something that would occur at Netflix. Um, we usually also have low bit rates uh, and we would have probably portable customer devices. Some people use smartphones, Mostly we would use a laptop because it's most convenient. So uh, these are, well, all different kinds of scenarios where you do something with the video, video streaming, video over the internet, and they have completely different, uh, yeah, prerequisites and things that, um, well, the provider needs to satisfy and needs to do so that users are satisfied. You can come up with other scenarios, of course, but these are, I think, somehow the most common ones. Do you have any questions or? Remarks? Okay, so this was the baseline that we took. Then we said, okay, let's try to merge this information. Let's try to see what happens if we take this as an assumption with typical, rather typical values. Um, we know something about these energy consumptions, partly because we did data measurements, partly because we found it in the literature. And then find out uh, what we can imagine, how much energy we will need for these things. And um, yeah, what are the challenges depending on these services, uh, what we need to do in order to be energy efficient. So what we did was we assumed just because we did so 100 million end users. I'm not sure if this is a typical value, but Netflix has this definitely. Um, then we could say, well, maybe people would use an and service one hour a day, that would be um, a movie every second day, for example. Then we try to come up with a reasonable set of customer devices. Like I said before, if we're going for video streaming, we would go for a high level TV, which is quite energy intensive. If you go for social networks, we would rather go for a smartphone and so on and so on. And uh, then we collected uh, energy values and we calculated, we did some multiplications and additions and so on. And we came up with these figures here. What do they mean? We have our four cases, on-demand video, IPTV, social networks, and teleconference. And each of these bars now represents the energy consumption that we estimated based on all these facts, data, and figures that we had before. I can show you all these values in the paper, but I think it's boring here. So just showing you these guys. Um, and well, they represent the power consumed by one of these three let's call them entities that I had at the beginning. So in blue, we have customer devices. That is you guys. We have data centers, that is Netflix. And we have transmission networks, that is, well, the transmission network. Um, and well, with all these assumptions, oh yeah, maybe here, uh, the, the, the vertical axis is the yearly energy consumption in terawatt hours, which is quite a common value that we often have. Um, and yeah, we have one, two, three, four, five. And we would see that uh, the, well, the, the most important reason for energy consumption differs quite uh, a lot depending on the use case that you have. And what does it mean here in the end? In on-demand video streaming, most power is consumed on TVs. So my advice for you would be, if you like to watch a Netflix movie, do it on your laptop. It will save uh, one tenth of the uh, ninety percent of the energy consumption, depending on the size of your screen, of course. Same is on IPTV. This is mainly because of TVs. In teleconference, you can see that this is lower. This is because I would not assume that people use their big TV, but here we assumed a mixture of desktop PCs and laptops. And in that case, I would uh, advise use your laptops for teleconferencing. Um, my next plan is to throw out my old desktop PC, in fact, because uh, new laptops can do exactly the same thing and, um, well, they are, they're much more energy efficient, in fact. Um, then, yes? I have a few, out of curiosity, did you evaluate a video projector? A video projector? No, I did not, but that's a good idea. Because it, I would assume it could be less uh, energy intensive 
and the TV. So just like to make to the out of curiosity, actually. Yes. It yeah. depends on the projector, maybe not this one. <laughs> <laughs> but the LED, uh, for example, the LED projector or even the projector like this yeah. one, I would be no. curious uh, compared to the TV, especially. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's something that has been done here by the uh, ESC. Uh, they have uh, analyzed uh, but the whole uh, greenhouse uh, emission due to production and use for uh, TV and uh, video projector. And uh, in fact, video projector consume a lot of uh, energy at the use. The... Yes, it consumes uh, a lot of electricity. Okay. It depends if it's less or a classical. Uh, yeah. Classical lamp will be quite high. Yes, definitely. If you have LED, it might be lower, probably. Yes. But mm -hmm. so it's a very good question. I, in fact, I did not have numbers for that. That's why I just look. Sometimes they tell it on. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's why uh, now they will use big TV instead of a video projector. From, okay. uh, from Google, uh, the TV is around one hundred eighty-seven kilowatt per hour, uh, and the uh, projector is one hundred eight. So it's Less than half. Okay. Mm -hmm. eight, 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 eight. From Google and the first slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asking uh, <laughs> of TV. Please ask ChatGPT. I was about to do it actually. <laughs> What's the energy consumption of doing the ChatGPT request? Oh, come on. <laughs> All the <laughs> I, I missed like IPTV on demand. What, what was the because on demand is Netflix, IPTV? It's IPTV is uh, like a football match, like football match okay. that you're watching. Yeah, okay, yeah. On, yeah. yeah it's like to live. Uh, exactly. Live live live. No, no, it's just I missed the connection with the previous oh. one. Mm -hmm. And uh, second, more important question. You have these like bars of terawatt hours, which represent example of network, but we, you have not tied them like the order of magnitude correspond to real network. But then uh, shift project give you the total consumption of all these use cases. Mm -hmm. So how do these bars add up? They are not meant to be added because you could have several on demand services. Mm -hmm. Yes. But what's the total number in terawatt hours from shift project? Very good question. I don't know. Four percent. Right? I it was greenhouse gases, so it's not the term. It was greenhouse gases, it's not the uh, green, yes. I think you have the energy consumption number. But they, they don't have the same uh, conclusion about the repartition between the different, uh, uh, between the transmission, uh, data center. And In fact, yes, they, they have higher. And they, um, I, I'm not completely sure why, uh, they have higher numbers, but I remember that there were some discussions one year later where they said that the numbers that the shift project gave were too high, and they said, yes, you're right, it's a little bit too high. They should have reduced it. Um, and then again, it's a question of how to attribute values. Yes. And at least the values that I took for my transmission are definitely different than those from the shift project because I took them from a paper from 2020. From the guy from Ericsson, who is here, but yes. it was nice to talk to him about that. <laughs> and uh, they are definitely a little bit lower. And he definitely also took into account this 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 offset power and this um, well this additional power that you have that I showed before. And uh, if you take this without this offset, then it, it's much lower. And I guess that's also a reason that mathematically this will seem lower. But in fact, it's what we often find that the transmission. Is not anymore a big issue in video streaming. At least uh, when you choose to do it and uh, you have this meaning with these bit rates, then the impact is not really big on, on the overall energy consumption. What is really more important is you end user device. And in terms of social network, what I wanted to come to next is uh, the reason why we have a very, very big bar here is encoding. Now you mentioned customer devices. It's like energy consumption of customer devices, but mm -hmm. also you you have some hypothesis that the TV has a five uh, years of lifespan and that to divide with the gray energy. Yeah, also good question. So we did not look at all the production. This is only during the use. So this would be even much bigger. Then it would be much bigger. Yeah, if you re if you replace it every second year, your TV, then of course it's much higher. 
um, but we did not look at this. So this is only the consumption during the use. And the one that we found to be really effective uh, when using it, well, okay, not really effective because data centers, it's hard to tell. Uh, of course, we included encoding energy, um, but still, if you watch Netflix, then they will not encode directly for you in real time. They will have done that beforehand, but still, we wanted to show this here. Firstly, because it's important. Secondly, because we're dealing with encoding and decoding. It makes sense. Okay, so but going on here, this encoding, the reason um, if it is really this high is difficult to say because we needed to find a value for encoding. And you all know that encoders have a range from ultra fast to very, 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 very slow, extremely slow. And what people actually use is hard to say. I have numbers for very, very slow. I have numbers for ultra fast. But um, yeah, we need to come up with something in between. And of course, we also have hardware encoders, where I believe that they will probably not use hardware encoders, but I don't know. Oh, to be honest, yes. we released the paper recently to explain recently, the right. encoders. Yes, I think that's right. One, one month ago, there was uh, also a talk of, of Facebook, and they talked about that. That's possible, yes? Probably because they're paying for the synergies. Mm -hmm. so it's an incentive to release this. Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, because of that, we're having, that's quite nice, we're having a uh, collaboration with them, and uh, we're talking about this and having research with this, in fact. So that's uh, why they also told us about that, and it's interesting that they try to incorporate and do better encoding. Um, yeah, so that's why this is definitely questionable, this high amount, but what makes sense is that people upload tons of material in terms of video at Facebook, as TikTok, and everywhere, and it definitely needs to be transcoded because not everyone can do your propriety codec that you have on your smartphone. They will have to transcode to at least some H.264 or something that everyone can watch. They will probably have something like a bitrate ladder and uh, it adapts to a huge amount of encoding. And that is the main reason we have for the data centers. Because the volume is speed of videos. Yes. So you just have a bigger number of video items. Yes. Yes, uh, all of this is a big question of magnitudes, in fact, orders of magnitude that we have here. So changing something in the range of 10 to 20% does not really make a big difference, but just because we have orders of magnitude in terms of users who watch a stream or users who upload streams, that's the big problem here. If you are a single user and you upload a single video, then of course it's relatively nothing, but just because we have millions and billions of them, um, it creates a problem ultimately. So, um, yeah, this is a, big, a quick um, recap of what we have. So if we are engineers and we want to say, okay, I want to do something more efficient, where should I start? Because I can have a big impact, because I can save a lot. And uh, there's something that we already had before from these figures, from these estimates, we could definitely say highest potential on the end user side is TV sets or desktop PCs. There's a lot that you can do. And in such social networks where you upload videos, thousands, tons of videos, it's definitely the transcoding. So everything else, the transmission is not that important, the storage is not that important, and uh, the CDN and how to operate your CDN is also not that important. Um, from, from this study, we found that these two things are things that we should have a look at. If we want to increase energy efficiency and if we want to save something. And uh, as you said, with Facebook and Meta, they are aware of this and they are trying to improve this. Yes? Um, a bit before you mentioned that uh, video streaming represented 1% of the mm -hmm. energy. What, does, what is taken into account for this 1%? Does it take into account the TV or is it just the video transiting over the network? Uh, it's, they say that, I, I had that before on that slide. So in fact, they are actually using this, uh, this pie chart. That was too far, or the, this one. So this is all, all of this adds up to the 1%, the production of devices and the use. Okay. 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 So they take into account the... Yes, they do. They do. They do in fact. And the networks is of this only, well, if you multiply 0.16% in this, but they do take it okay. into account. Um, I think what they did not take into account is disposal, which would be interesting. And where I'm not sure, what is really difficult to figure out is production of videos. 
If you record just a single one on Facebook, that's simple. But if you have Star Wars with all the pipeline behind, it would be really interesting research. If you have someone to do that, uh, or it's myself, I would, I would really like to have a look at that and see what it is. Of course, it depends. It will depend on if you have Star Wars or some uh, movie on, on uh, from, from Pixar. It's all different, what happens and what they need to do, or if something is only, um, or if they take all the scenes here in France, or if they travel from, from New Zealand to Australia or whatever. Uh, but that is a different question again. It's about the production of videos that I think is not part here. Um, if we look at those uh, three in terms of views that are central network and end users, they seem to be balanced. Yes. And what you've shown is a uh, big imbalance. Yes. Uh, where did the network go? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You can see the data center for, for the social network yeah. and the end user for the rest. Where yeah. did the network go? Yeah, very good question. I believe it's uh, the, the data that I used from that, that I had available, like uh, the one that I showed before. So sorry for the, for the online guys that you cannot see that. But uh, what I use is um, here if we have the, the throughput and the power is uh, I, I use this law and the guys from the ship project definitely used such a slope, which is by calculations. They did not think about them. There might be some offset. And as I said, there's an accounting thing. That is one reason. Uh, and I used a, a more recent value for that because the payment was from 2020. I guess that also decreased because it decreased over the last 10 years by several orders of magnitude. So the, the the power that you need per throughput. And it's still so you need to share the P0 between uh, the different uh, different users, for example. Sorry? You, you only take into account the slope of your curve. So you need to share the P0 between uh, people using the. No, I did not do this here. I think not. The script was a lot of parameters. I did not. <laughs> Yeah, but in fact, we did not take into account the number of, um, yeah, yeah. you would have to take into account the number of base stations that you use, the number of uh, internet exchange points and so on. And for that, I did not have any data. So I took what they choose to be the, uh, well, if you have no data on that, the, the mean value throughput per joule or joule per throughput or something like that. Mm. It's just we, well, we're lacking the measurement. Okay, so if we think about that, uh, mm -hmm. it's not very interesting to have new uh, video connect because uh, if the transmission uh, do not provide, uh, do not need a lot of energy, uh, yes. it's not interesting to have new video connect reducing the difference. Mm -hmm. I think so, yes. I think it's slowly we're at that point where it does not really make much sense and putting <laughs> big neural networks on that. <laughs> Yeah, yes, but even that, uh, you have to talk to people to get from a Maybe yes, <laughs> maybe they will not like me anymore. <laughs> we don't need you anymore. Yeah. I think no, it's, it's a good question. We've seen this with uh, with audio compression. Nowadays, Apple is using uh, is using um, lossless compression for audio because just the data rate that we have available are so high that audio doesn't count anymore at all. And it's a question of time until the same happens to video, in, in my opinion. At the moment, there is something that in terms of transmission, we're at a point that where additional rate savings are not that important anymore in terms of energy consumption, I think. But there is a base for us. Sorry? There is still this base uh, yeah. fixed power, which is which depends on the, uh, as you mentioned, like the maximal throughput somehow. Uh, maybe not. if we can transfer twice as less throughput, then we can reduce the Finally. Yeah. But maybe we will not always stay with video. If you have immersive video, media, point clouds, 
beta rates will rise again and we will maybe have a similar issue. We will see. I don't know yet. It's interesting. Okay, so uh, this was the system level thing uh, that I wanted to talk about. This is in, indeed very interesting to talk about. It's more philosophical. We did not do any measurements for this study. Uh, some reviewers said, why don't you do measurements for that? And I said, well, I, I didn't want to exactly for this because I would have to do measurements for everything and I can't do measurements for everything. We don't have a data center and we don't have knowledge on what happens in data centers. So we just took what we found in the literature and I think still it's quite interesting to see what happens to have an overview. Um, and it's a first guide on looking at, well, where can we start? Where can we try to improve things? Um, and now I would like to go in one more technical solution that we looked at into the decoding energy, uh, which is, I hope, uh, of interest for you. And I think also from the time, oh yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I'm happy that we're having nice discussions on this. So uh, let, let me talk about decoding energy consumption. If you have no more questions on the very high level philosophical discussion beforehand. Yes? If you have to suppose how accurate are the number that you report in that study, mm -hmm. which number would be this? You mean like a percentage? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like numbers. I'm an engineer. You like numbers? So... Okay. Seven? Okay. That's a good number. I will not tell you the unit, I'm unsure. <laughs> No, I'm really so it's it's really just uh, they're very very rough. So uh, yeah, and there was a nice presentation yesterday, and the guy was asked, "Are those results generalizable?" And he said, "Totally ungeneralizable." <laughs> I think that was very honest, and I think it's it's quite uh, the same. Uh, but what I think maybe to to go on in that direction is, I think it's not about is this number three point eight exact. I think what is reliable is that we have these different orders of magnitude. So it makes a difference. I think this order of magnitude is quite correct. So in the logarithmic region, it is okay-ish, we would say. Um, but if it's now two or five or something, it's not that important, but it's in the region terawatt hours. It's not like something like gigawatt hours or kilowatt hours. And I think that is what is really important here to look at the orders of magnitude and not the actual absolute numbers. But yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so let's go into decoding. Video communications need decoding, as we all know, it's quite important. And what we did a lot since I began my studies, in fact, in, in Erlangen, we took some decoders that were available back then, we put them on our uh, CPUs and we bought a nice power meter and we measured the power consumption of the decoder. And afterwards we could play them on something of course, on a TV, for example. And then we wanted to find out about uh, the quality, about the energy, and if we can improve stuff. And uh, we came up with some tools on how to evaluate that. So here, this is more or less about how to evaluate different tools. Um, you know that encoding and decoding is mostly, um, well, you, you would, you would uh, judge how good it is by rate distortion curves. So rate distortion curves is well known. We have, for example, a bit stream file size. So the rate, we have the distortion often in PSNR, and then you have a codec or a certain encoder or something like that. And then you would draw and create your rate distortion curves. You can have four different encoders, and then you can have something like Yondega Delta values. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that. Now, how to take into account the energy in this? Uh, it's a third kind of dimension, and we were not quite sure how to do that. And we came up with a solution that personally I like quite a lot because it's um, illustrative and it's easy to understand. We just took the same concept but replaced the bitstream file size in this horizontal axis by the decoding energy that we measured. So here, this is really in joules for single videos. We took some decoder, HM, VTM, open HEVC, open BBC, and we measured the energy consumption for a video. And we can put them on the x-axis and take the exact same PSNR values on the y-axis. With such kind, we can say, well, nowadays, uh, the bitstream file size or the bitrate is not that important anymore, as we've just discussed beforehand. It's not of a big deal, but the energy is maybe more important. Let's have a closer look at that. So uh, the energy is important and the quality, maybe even more than the bitrate, at least in my opinion. Um, but 
here we still get some nice results. And here you could see, so these are some actual measurements with four different encoders. So this is uh, something that we really measured. And then we calculated the famous BD rate values. In this case, uh, B with respect to A, so the blue one on the left, is the one that is optimized for um, rate distortion performance. And then we have some other encoders which were optimized for, in fact, decoding energy consumption. And we found that, uh, unfortunately, the beyond the data rate increases. So we need more rate. So we had values, for example, 3%, 5%, 10% more rate for the same um, distortion. And then we did the same for the right part, some very fancy um, encoder. You can construct bit streams that um, make the decoder require less decoding energy, which is quite cool. And you would see that here you have um, the blue one, which is good for rate distortion, um, but apparently bad for decoding energy because we had more than 11 joules. And you can reduce this in this case by more than half. And um, yeah, your whole energy distortion curve would go to the left, and you can even calculate the undergard delta values by replacing the rate with the energy. And you would have something that we called the Ontega delta decoding energy, and you would have a percentage that at the same quality, you can have some um, savings in terms of decoding energy. Uh, then uh, I could talk a lot more about uh, this idea with the encoding, but uh, I brought to you another example that is more recent, and that was used with DVC, because the other one was, H was HGVC. This is a work that a colleague of mine did. Um, Matthias Krenzler, I'm not sure, maybe you've heard of him, you know him for sure. He's quite active in the last four to five years. He did tons of measurements for VVC and he used all of the different VVC encoders and decoders that are available. And what he tested was that he used uh, one encoder implementation, which is very nicely configurable nowadays. You have tons of tools in VVC, like MIP and Intra, um, what else do we have? Subpartitioning, different block sizes, and all the stuff. Uh, and it's, in fact, a big design space. You could choose, do I use that tool, yes or no? You can switch it on and off. And he did that, and he did some very extensive testing, and uh, he did some um, design space exploration with that. And he found that we can, in fact, uh, well, optimize our encoder only by this configuring for decoding energy. What we see here is on the horizontal axis, we have got a beyond the gap delta rate. In this case, we use VMAF as the quality metric because nowadays we use VMAF instead of PSNR. And we can see that the baseline is up here. That was pure, I don't remember it was VTM or VBANC, but one of those. Uh, and it had, of course, when we compare it with itself, we have 0%. And then if we change the tools somehow, then we will have increased bit rates because, of course, it was optimized. And then on the vertical axis, we can see the energy savings in terms of VDVE, also with respect to VMAF. Um, and each of these points now corresponds to one configuration. So a set of tools that is switched on and off in some man manner or matter or in some way. I don't have the exact values of that, of course, because it's a lot of zeros, ones, zeros, ones, 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 zeros, and so on in a big list. Uh, but all of that is one configuration of the encoder, and he did the encoding, he measured how much energy we need for decoding, and he found that only by using this tool on and off switching, we can reach up to well, 40% of energy savings on average down here. Uh, and he also tested that for HEVC while changing nothing. HEVC was, I think, right here. In the end, it had more energy consumption, the decoder, than the BBC decoder, which was quite cool to see that uh, we could outperform it. Of course, HVC was not optimized for decoding energy, uh, but still, as an uh, uh, yeah, as a comparison, it was nice to see. Yeah, and then depending on what you want to have, you could choose a target bit rate. For example, here five percent does not seem too much in terms of a higher bit rate, but still, if you have thirty percent energy savings for the decoding, that is quite cool. I think so. It's uh, quite a nice trade-off, and depending on that you would be able to choose. Um, yes, and this is one of the things that, that we did at our church to try to reduce the decoding energy. 
uh, which uh, in fact is very, very helpful and which uh, can save a lot, which is also interesting. We did not look at that yet. Of course, we want to do that. Switching tools off does not only lead to uh, different power consumptions on the decoder, but of course also on the encoder, because it will not check that specific tool, which is a second plus, uh, but it's not included in these results, but there is work to come, of course. And uh, having both of that is, of course, very good to have. Okay, then, uh, because I'm a little bit over time. You have too many questions. I have too many questions, maybe, <laughs> but it's correct now, the, the, the call is perfect. Yes, good time. All right, we got that. So uh, let me come to the summary and outlook, and then we can still discuss. And if you have questions on that too. So uh, just very quickly, of course, video streaming consumes a lot of energy. That is something that we find out nowadays that is unquestionable. Um, from our study, we found that the encoding and the end-user devices, and the end-user devices, again, the decoding has quite some impact, is most important. And what we are planning right now is we're working on the encoder and encoder energy optimizations. Um, we're working on joint encoder and decoder optimizations. So you have seen that we have this big pipeline and uh, many, many videos are available. Some videos, most of the videos are watched one or two times. Some videos are watched millions of times, and there is a big bunch of millions of videos that are watched something in between. And depending on what you think or what is expected, how often a video is watched, um, you can choose your encoder, for example, so that the bitrate is reduced, which would be better for saving for the end user. Or if you know that no one watches it, then you should not well use power for that. So. That is some space where we would like to look at in joint encoder decoder optimization or the whole chain. Um, and this ultimately leads to the video streaming system optimization, which is uh, well at the very, very beginning, a very interesting topic that I hope to be able to do research on. Uh, yeah, we're starting with it right now, but uh, there's a lot of interest in this. Yeah, and uh, with that, yeah, let's try to not destroy our planet. And uh, yeah, it's, it's me. We're always looking at our thing and our son may not watch TV. This is not nice of us. So let's try to make it possible for them. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks for listening. And if you have more questions, please uh, feel free. And if you have ideas on what we could do in terms of research together, of course, also, I'm very happy to be here with you and to be able to talk to guys who are really working on a real-time, practically usable VVC decoder, HEVC decoder. And that's uh, something that uh, is, yeah, special for me. Yes, please. I have questions about um, the last sections and about this uh, PT energy, this VT uh, energy matrix. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And the first question I have is Did you try or did you consider to compute PD rate of PD rate? So you just use the PD rate value of your four QP configurations, mm -hmm. and then you just like have different configurations according to the energy, and then you just make these integrals of that. Um, which configuration would you choose for each BD rate value? Right. So the QP is already integrated. So then uh, you don't need to compare, you just need to compare the visual quality with the. Okay. So uh, I think, well, we, we had some discussions on how to do that. And it's also difficult to answer. Let's see. So in general, as I said before, we have a three dimensional space. Yes, right? Yes, yes. So we have D, distortion, um, and maybe let's take the rate. We have the energy. Yeah. And we have the quality. That should be an E. Distortion, yeah. <laughs> Can I remove parts of that? Not only yes, if you use the eraser, the one, the, the top one. Yes, this one. And then you can erase uh, only what you want. Okay. <laughs> Ah, good. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that is better. Yeah. So you would span up a surface. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we tried that in yes. decoding, and the surface was not really helpful. Good. I found 
solutions and ways where people looked at complexity and they spanned different surfaces and they calculated the average distance between the surfaces, which you can do, but you need to have an overlap in the surfaces. Yep, yep. Um, and in rate distortion, sometimes we have learned that having this, this overlap is it's okayish, but it's sometimes not really big like this sometimes, and people never know about that. Um, and when you look at the decoding energy, I barely found really nice, helpful things where you would have overlap. Yeah. However, I think where it might make sense and where it might be interesting, but that's something that I want to do, uh, I hope soon, is in encoding energy. Just because in encoding, in decoding energy, we have a quite little range of energies. It's, it's not really large. In encoding energies, we're going over different orders of magnitude. We're having one frame per second up to 0 0.001 frame per second. So you can have a, um, a surface of a very, very big range in, in this diagram. And then comparing X264 with um, X266 or something like that, X265 might be again interesting. But uh, we have to do that. Okay. And then uh, follow-up questions. It's because it triggered me a bit that you said that you're not looking at the bit rate at all and you just look at the visual quality of the options. Mm -hmm. Yes, now. Because I think that you have to suppose that the bit rate, that your curve is monotonic, if you want that your result makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because if your bit rate is doing something like a big potato, I'm not sure that then you can uh, really do the thing. But then I was wondering when I started to think about that, would you use rate control to fix that? You fix the rate with rate control. So this is not a determinant anymore. Mm -hmm. fix. Then you have even PSNR, mm -hmm. and then you have your energy, and then you can just mm -hmm. uh, compute uh, EG okay. energy with. Uh, yes. So, so first of all, what we have in this, there is no uh, optimization for energy. We just yeah. switch on to uh, switch on that tool. Yeah. It's still rate distortion optimization. So here is not a problem. We still do have something that I also uh, like quite a lot, but I didn't prepare it for this slide. For these slides, um, we have an encoder, which. Uh, where we have um, rate distortion optimization, which is extended with the energy. Yes. So we have distortion yeah. plus lambda. lambda mal rate plus lambda multiplied with the energy. Uh, the the we, same lambda or two lambda? Uh, they, they are different. They, are different. they have to be different. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, in, and then there was a ni very nice theory behind and this uh, optimization and stuff and so on. Yeah, and uh, you have to decide for this lambda and this lambda. And we had a parameter which we at the end used to find a good trade-off between the two. Um, and something that you would get as an output is very, very similar to uh, to this curve, to this green curve. You would be somewhere here. Yeah. And there is a position where you do not really save any more energy, but the rate would increase and it would do strange things. So if you would do the lambda right here to zero and the rate would not care anymore, then this is not what you want at the end. So you should always keep this lambda somehow in, in your mind. What you can do, however, you could say, well, the rate, you're right, it has an impact and we could give it an energy value for the rate and you could include that in your optimization. And then this R would be indirectly part of your energy and then it is included again. And that is something that is easily doable. It's just a parameter. Just out of curiosity, um, is, it, is it different this kind of model compared to R, uh, RDC? Model that it's a rate distance complexity. Um, mm -hmm. Because for us, of course, we are dealing more with complexity and energy yep. in our daily life with yep. the weather and with statistics. Yep. And it's something that we we had thousands of ideas and things that mm -hmm. we make and we never had time. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, you uh, that, so. Absolutely. Uh, that's also something that I want to check. RDC, rate distortion complexity, as yeah. I've learned it, and as I think that you are looking at that, is most, more mainly focusing on encoding energy. Yes, yes. And that yes. is, of course, a major I conceptual difference. I've always forgotten that it's about decoding. This is decoding energy, yeah. in fact, but you could do it for encoding energy. But... Oh, the model, the, okay, this model is also for decoding. Okay, it's, it's, this is for decoding. The the, okay. Yes. Also, conceptually, it will be different because in this case, we. Um, well, we, we assume that we have a decoder and we know about the power consumption of the decoder. For example, you know the power consumption of SAO filtering. And then you can choose with this equation, should I switch it on or off? 
how, how much distortion does it bring or how much um, quality does it bring while switching it on with respect to switching it off and having a lower energy. Yeah. So uh, the encoding process is only changed in such a way that there is a decoder energy model integrated. So it uses more knowledge while uh, the RDC concept would uh, well, it would finally decide, do I check a certain coding mode, yes or no? Yeah. So it's a little bit different in that context, but of course highly correlated. And uh, as, as you, I would also really like to do that yeah. and use energy instead of complexity yes. for the encoding. Uh, I have a question for uh, Yes, yes, yes. All of these videos, mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, on uh, software decoder. Yes. And my question is, did you try with the hardware decoder? And yes. Not, okay. And uh, how it looks when it's a hardware decoder? Mm -hmm. How this result looks? I have two possibilities. Either uh, I will show you on Friday or I open the presentation on Friday. Yes. That's, that's there I have some results. But okay. uh, to, to be quick, um, okay, we do not have any hardware decoder for VVC yet available. So this one I don't know, but this one for HEVC, we, yeah. we test it. And uh, this, this thing, unfortunately, did not really help, to be honest. The hardware decoder did not care. It's, it's just running, and uh, yeah. it, um, it makes a difference if you switch on in-loop filtering or off. That's a difference because that is a separate entity yes. in the process. Yes. But most of the other things is, is just, well, it's a chip that is running. So there is very tiny difference. There is one, in fact, but it's tiny. I think something like what we have here, 20 to 30%, at something like 1 to 2%. Yeah. Um, but what again helps, and you also then again have possibilities, and please everyone, if you have time and if you are allowed to, please uh, join our very nice workshop. You are also aware of that on Friday, that yeah. I will talk about that. Um, in hardware decoders, what matters is bitrate, we're back to bitrate a little bit, uh, resolution and frame rate. Yeah. And you can do a lot in those three directions. Yes. And that's what we also have again. It's quite nice in the green MPEG standard. That's what we try to cover there. And that is a lot of knowledge that you need on your end user device to know what is best for you. That is a problem with this one. It helps, yes, but only for that decoder that you are using and that you are optimizing for. So also this depends. By the way, that was also interesting. We did some measurements. We had streaming on that laptop and on a desktop PC. And we compared VP9 with HEVC. And we took some random player. I'm not sure which one. And we did measurements on the laptop and the desktop PC. And what I found quite funny is on that laptop, H.264 decoding was much more energy efficient than VP9. It was 20 watts versus 12 watts. On the desktop PC, it was the exact opposite. VP9 had, I think, 1979 watts, and H264 had, I think, 86 watts, something oh, like that. Software. I think that was the main issue, that one of them was using hardware decoding and the other yeah. software, and the other one the way around. But it was surprising because I would have thought, well, H264 is available in hardware everywhere, so why not use it? So um, you never know. Really <laughs> <laughs> It's just because it needs to use the uh, heterogeneous architecture in your application and uh, the purpose of not good enough for that. Yes, probably that's the reason. Definitely. Uh, it's hard. It's really complex. It's shared memory. It's like uh, that. <laughs> so. We have another question, and uh, if people online wish to ask a question, you can just open the microphone. Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, so I'm Xavier Duclos. Uh, you, you know me a little bit. We had a, a few calls in the past. Uh, and uh, I was chairing the Green MPEG uh, a long time ago. Uh, yes. So I, I agree with you that uh, uh, reducing uh, energy on the decoding side um, may be much more important than uh, reducing the, the bit rate. And, and maybe uh, MPEG should have addressed uh, this uh, topic before uh, developing uh, the, the VVC codec, but uh, it's another story. And uh, uh, concerning your your work uh, with uh, the, the the switch the switching off, uh, uh, are you proposing uh, new profiles within VVC, or uh, is your aim 
to to build a, a new a new codec, a VVC based codec, but uh, a green greener uh, VVC based uh, codec. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, in one of these tracks, we work together with the Fraunhofer guys from Berlin, who are responsible for VVENC, and we had a paper with them on an energy efficient configuration. And they told us that they would probably include this as a profile for their VVENC encoder. But to be honest, I'm not sure if they did that. They just said so. But uh, they were really interested in that because only because of this research, they were able to show a real time demo of the VVC decoder on the last ICIP. Otherwise, it would not have been real time. So it was a real application for that, which was cool. But we're not uh, proposing this on JBET. At the moment, at least. Mm -hmm. But it's a good idea. Maybe we should do. Why not? Maybe, but you you need to find some Supporting some support as as, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, oh. on on harmonic side, we we are not engaged anymore on MPEG side. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot for the feedback.